Hey, this is Pastor Bungie Garrett, and I want to take some time today to present you with another word of encouragement. Well, it's the last day of Black History Month, and so I thought that this would be an excellent opportunity for us to consider the systemic racism which has been implemented by the left and long after the Republican Party passed the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendments. For example, it was just 45 years after the 15th Amendment gave black American men the right to vote. That's when a Democrat named Woodrow Wilson, he was elected to the position of president of the United States. And listen, within two years of his election, President Wilson screened the infamous movie titled Birth of a Nation, and he aired this movie inside the White House. Now, just to be clear, The Birth of a Nation was a three-hour film that portrays the Reconstruction era of America as a complete failure. Not only that, but the film also depicted the the Democrat-led Ku Klux Klan as the post-Civil War saviors of the South. While it's true that the days of the KKK's terrorism have been greatly diminished by the Civil Rights Act of 1875, it's also true that Woodrow Wilson helped to bring about a second wave of the KKK simply by airing the birth of a nation there inside the White House. Not only that, but his decision to air this racist film there in the White House, it was preceded by his decision to allow the resegregation of the civil services there in the federal government. As a matter of fact, it was prior to his election during the days of Republican presidents like William McKinley and Theodore Roosevelt and William H. Taft. That's when black Americans worked at all different levels of the federal government. But then in 1913, after Woodrow Wilson secured the presidency for the Democratic Party, the civil service of the federal government was then resegregated by his own decisions. And two years later, President Wilson screened the pro-KKK movie, The Birth of a Nation, there in the White House. So, listen, it's not unreasonable for us to think that Wilson was implicitly endorsing the racist hatred that we see inside of this horrible film. You might be also interested to know that the next Democrat candidate to win the presidential election was President Franklin D. Roosevelt. And and rather than endorsing racist movies like Birth of a Nation, FDR was determined to capture the black vote, and he did this by presenting the promises that are better known as the New Deal. Now, just to be clear, the New Deal included a series of programs that promised benefits to black voters, and yet it's sad to say that the New Deal actually set the stage for a new form of systemic racism. For example, the New Deal gave birth to the Public Works Administration, which then used U.S. tax dollars to build segregated public housing in many cities like Atlanta, St. Louis, as well as San Francisco. During his second term in office, FDR also used the Federal Housing Administration, or the FDA, to guarantee bank loans to mass production builders who were willing to build large subdivisions for whites only. Here's how a historian named Richard Rothstein explains it, and I quote him here, The FHA built homes that working class families could afford, and the loans were conditioned on the builder promising not to sell homes to African Americans and even required builders to attach restrictive covenants to deeds so owners could not resell to African Americans. That's right, FDR used his political power as president to create a federally funded segregation which has had a lasting effect here in our nation. Now in light of the historical facts, Rothstein goes on to insist this and I quote him again, As long as people believe that ghettos were created by accident, they're going to think that they can only disappear by accident. If people understand that they were created by explicit policy, they are open to understanding that the only way that they can be undone is by equally purposeful policy. That's right, our nation must realize that the segregation that we still see in most major cities today, it's actually a long-lasting effect of FDR's democratic policies, which were uh, you know, hidden within the New Deal. Not only that, but we should also consider the way that a Democrat named Lyndon B. Johnson continued to secure the black vote for the Democratic Party, despite the fact that he was a well-known racist. It was after President Kennedy was assassinated. That's when his vice president, Lyndon B. Johnson, or LBJ, 
he used the civil rights bill that President Kennedy, uh, Kennedy ha had a actually introduced. He used this bill to become the apparent champion of the civil rights movement. Now, uh, before we consider the way that LBJ used the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to secure black votes for the Democratic Party, it's important for us to remember that this act was opposed by the same Southern Democrats who had signed the Southern Manifesto of 1956, which was written in resistance of the racial integration which was happening here in our nation. Now, according to one account, it was March 12, 1956. That's when Senator Harry Byrd of Virginia, he convinced 101 of the 128 congressmen representing the 11 states of the old Confederacy to sign the Southern Manifesto uh, regarding integration. And in total, 19 senators and 82 representatives, which is almost one fifth of the Congress, signed their name and declared their opposition to integration. Now, just to be clear, this group, it included 97 Democrats and four Republicans who opposed racially segregated public education. And they did this on the grounds that it was allegedly unconstitutional, thereby constituting an abuse of power in violation of federal law. Well, sadly, this was the same group of Democratic uh, sen senators who, who also opposed Johnson's Civil Rights Act of 1964. As a matter of fact, the Southern senators from Johnson's party launched a filibuster against the Civil Rights Bill, which uh, ended up in debates that lasted for 60 days. That's right, it was the Southern Democrats who opposed the civil rights legislation by engaging in the longest filibuster in the history of our country's government. It's also interesting to note that the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, it, it was uh, actually, it was the Republican minority uh, that successfully pushed this legislation through. That's right, it wasn't the, the Democrats who secured this victory, it was the Republicans. It was the minority Republicans who pushed this legislation through. And while it's true that LBJ uh, and, and the Democrat Party has received the, the praise and the accolades for this piece of legislation, it's important for us to realize that LBJ uh, actually had, uh, you know, apparently uh, racist motives for his decision to champion this bill. And, and I want to consider the way that Dr. Carol Swain explains it in a documentary that's titled The Inconvenient Truth About the Democratic Party. It's in, this, it's in this video where she declares this, and I quote her, when all of their efforts to enslave blacks, keep them enslaved, and then keep them from voting had failed, the Democrats came up with a new strategy. If black people are going to vote, they might as well vote for Democrats. As President Lyndon Johnson was purported to have said about the Civil Rights Act, I'll have them, N-words, voting Democrat for 200 years. Now, he didn't say N-words. He, he said the racist word. And, and, and if this quote is accurate, then we can, we can see here that LBJ was less interested in civil rights and just more interested in making sure that black Americans voted Democrat. Brendan Morse elaborates on this documentary in an article titled The Inconvenient Truth About the Democratic Party's History of Racism. It's in this article where he declares, and I quote, Johnson's War on Poverty enacted anti-poverty legislation such as the Food Stamp Act of, of 1964 and the Social Security Act of 1964. And then from 1965 to 1974, government provided benefits increased by a factor of 20. As the Cato Institute noted in a study, these entitlement programs incentivized lifestyles that encouraged government dependence, such as single motherhood, in order to continue to receive greater government benefits. This reliance on government dependence encourages voting in favor of the party that champions welfare and entitlements. That's right. The, policy, the, uh, the policies of, of the Democratic Party not only created the conditions for a segregated society, but they also incentivized a welfare class that now relies on the government. And in this way, the Democratic Party now prospers on the votes of the very people that it spent much of its history oppressing. Dr. Carol Swain sums it up in this way, and I quote her, Since its founding in 1829, the Democratic Party has fought against every major civil rights initiative and has a long history of discrimination. The Democratic Party defended slavery, started the Civil War, opposed Reconstruction, founded the Ku Klux Klan, imposed segregation, perpetrated lynchings, and fought against the Civil Rights Acts of 1950s and 1960s. 
She's exactly right. The Democratic Party has a long and consistent history of racially driven oppression. And it's for this reason that every American will do well to realize that their open border policies today is just more of the same. That's right. They're looking for a new slave class who are ready to vote for them for the next 200 years. And as we consider, uh, you know, the, the Democratic Party's history of racism, well, it's crucial for every Christian to realize that this political party of oppression is the same party that protects pedophiles and pornographic materials in our public schools. They want to ensure that women have the legal right to terminate the, the, the life of their preborn baby. Uh, they're, they're also enabling officials and professionals to transition kids and without parental approval. Uh, listen, as we consider all of these things, trust me when I tell you, all of these policies are in conflict with God's will. And all of these policies are in conflict with God's word. And it's for this reason that we really need to pray and we need to ask the Lord Jesus to raise up born again believers who can lead our nation to, to, to you know, lead us back in line with the Christian foundations of our constitution. And, and being that politics is downstream from our culture, it's crucial for every Christian to change the culture of our nation and to do this by accomplishing the great commission of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go and let's preach the gospel of grace to everyone, regardless of their race. And as we share the good news of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit will empower us as we continue to fight the good fight of faith and all for the glory of God.